Story three. My sister went missing in 1993, she came back, but she's not herself now, my parents are in danger. It was April 16th, 1989, when my parents, Carrie Long Matthew Stevens, welcomed their baby girl into the world. They named her Dolores, unaware of the meaning of the name Sorrows. Little Dolly had hazelnut brown hair, big brown eyes. My mother often spoke of how her rosy cheeks, fair skin, pretty frilly dresses, made her look identical to a porcelain doll. Even at the age of four, people were surprised at how dainty delicate she was. The way she was described by others, she was perfect. Despite her being an accidental pregnancy, my parents being no older than 15 at the time, she was considered a blessing. I don't begrudge her the love my parents have always had for her, but for once I wish I could have meant as much to them as she did. I never met the girl. I was born in 2005, long after she went missing. After losing Dolly the series of miscarriages that followed, my parents had not much love left. I was born more for the sake of it than anything. I never went a day without hearing about Dolly my other lost siblings too. They attempted to name some of them, but gave up after the eighth. Babies that were never born, yet I could never live up to them. Memorial decor filled our home, not that it ever felt like home to me. Hazel would have been a beautiful girl with hair like dolls. Angel would have had Dolly's kind nature. What about me? Mallory, Molly, and tall, thin, with pasty skin, beady brown eyes. I am not the beauty my sister was, but I'm here. I never left. You can just imagine how I felt when Dolly appeared on our doorstep in January, covered in dirt. Her hair remained in pigtails, she wore a pink summer dress. Should she not be a 30-year-old woman by now? She turned five on her birthday, but was four when she showed up. I stepped out of the house to go to school, saw her sitting in the front yard, as if she never left. I paused for a moment, thinking it was just some random girl. I went inside, got my dad, telling him there's an abandoned toddler outside. Mom was showering, unaware I'd just found her long lost daughter. Oh my, Dolly, Dolly, is that you? Come to daddy, baby girl. I've missed you so much, he sobbed as he squeezed her tight. She didn't react at first only when he pulled away, looked into her eyes, said gently, Dolly. Did she respond with an enthusiastic daddy? I was more confused than anything as I watched this all unfold. How could this child be my missing older sister? How could she just turn up 26 years later without a scratch on her without aging a day? I tried to point this out, but no one acknowledged my protests. Needless to say, mom was just as ecstatic as dad had been, if not more. Dolores was sweet in the beginning. I'd sit watch her play draw. She was a normal, pretty little girl. I wanted to ask what happened, but my parents insisted we move past it. They were just grateful to have their dolly back. I, for one, felt more pushed out than ever. My first real suspicion of Dolly not being Dolly began on the Thursday following her reappearance. I mentioned the stuffed horse she'd been known to carry around with her. She looked me dead in the eyes, then looked down at my drawing of horses in a field tore it up, all the while screaming, I hate horses over, over until the paper was practically confetti. She then looked up at me again, said in her not so sweet little voice, and I hate you. I didn't chase after her when she stomped upstairs to her bedroom. I just sat there, mouth agape, trying to process what had just happened. Up until then, we'd been having quite a nice time scribbling away with her crayons together. Perhaps the horse was a trigger for her. I tried not to take it personally, but the oddities didn't stop there. Her once thick and healthy loose curls were falling out in clumps. Her ivory skin was turning a grayish greenish blue. Her adorable brown eyes were blackening, and she was getting unexplainably thinner. I tried to express my concerns to my parents, but they wouldn't hear it. Dolly hasn't ever thrown a tantrum. Stop trying to get her into trouble. Don't say such things about your sister. Nothing is wrong with her. The last few months have been strange, to say the least, but nothing major has happened. For the most part, I'd had a nice time hanging out with my sister, and having her around made me less jealous than before. I didn't see her as competition anymore, just my unfortunate older baby sister, Dolores. That was until last Sunday. It was the night before the anniversary of the day she went missing, and I awoke to her standing beside my bed, watching me sleep. 
half asleep. I asked, Dolly, what are you doing? They got rid of me. Then they replaced me with you. They have to pay. What are you talking about? It's not your fault, Molly. It was mommy. She didn't see me get in the car. She left me in the woods and daddy helped her. They have to pay. She then walked out and went to sleep. It didn't happen again and neither of us mentioned it. I began researching her disappearance. The things she said, what did they mean? I thought about how she hadn't aged and how she'd been covered in dirt when I found her. Then I thought about my mother's history of suicide attempts near the time of Dolly's disappearance. Then I thought about her unusually colored skin, her hair, and her eyes. I researched children going missing and coming back the exact same age. Dolores was one of many. All the children died mysteriously after being found, and a lot of them did some strange things before they passed. Some killed animals, family pets, siblings, family, other children their age. Or they commit arson, attacked people, or made strange art. I realized their art, actions, or weird things they said connected to their disappearances. Maggie Price was found in her backyard, 13 years after her disappearance, still a little girl, and covered in bruises. She cut her dad's hands off as he slept, before stabbing him in the throat. Their decaying bodies were found three days later. There were all sorts of stories like this. It occurred to me to check Dolly's drawings. Cars, forests, dirt, shovels, mom and dad with X's for eyes. I ran to the garage where her toy horse was framed on the wall, then climbed into my dad's car. When I got to the woods closest to my house, I knew where to go. Our old dog, Ducky's grave. There it was, an empty hole beside his place of burial. Something had escaped. No, someone. I've been staying at a friend's house since then. I know that I can't stop Dolores from completing her unfinished business, or I'll become part of it. I'm starting the grieving process for her and my parents now to make it easier for myself when they die. To be honest, I'm going to miss Dolly most. Story four. I waited 24 hours to report my six-year-old missing. When the officer asked me how long she'd been missing, I swallowed the lump of nerves in my throat and said, 30 hours. He started to write the number down, then stopped. It took you 30 hours to realize your daughter was missing. I shook my head. I noticed she was missing when I woke up yesterday morning, but I know you have to wait 24 hours to file a missing persons report. Ma, I am. That's a lie. It's vitally important that you report these incidents as soon as possible, okay? Every hour that passes makes it that much less likely we'll ever find your daughter. Anxiety clawed from my stomach back into my throat, prompting me to swallow again. Tears nipped at the corner of my eyes. My hands wrung themselves into a knot. All the warmth in my body slipped away. I... I didn't know. That... He gave me a hard, scrutinizing look, then chalked me up as one more victim of poorly written crime shows and asked some other questions. Ever since she was born premature, Mary had been a constant source of worrying for me. She developed too slowly, had difficulty with object permanence, found balancing nearly impossible. Her physical problems ironed themselves out with the help of frequent trips to the pediatrician's office, making her relatively normal by the age of two, but new problems cropped up. She liked to pull hair, strings, chains, anything that appeared to be connected to something, especially important or sensitive things. She liked to lie if I asked her why she kept pulling the dog's tail. She'd throw her hands up or hand if one was busy holding the tail and say, no, I not. Timeouts didn't work. Scoldings didn't work. Holding her close, explaining what was wrong, taking away toys, none of that worked. My father took her upstate for a weekend and came back with a bite mark on his hand, admitting to spanking her. Not for the bite, which had come after the spanking, but for talking back. Somewhere, somehow, she'd learned the words asshole and die, even though I thought I'd done my best to minimize exposure to coarse language. Finally, I thought I'd found a method that worked. I told her to take a walk around the house after she broke a glass on purpose, saying to think about what she did, and for whatever reason she decided to obey. She walked from the kitchen to her bedroom, to the living room, to the kitchen again, over and over until she started to sniffle. I stopped her around the sixth lap, 
and offered to put on cartoons. Her casual, though not abnormal, cruelty lessened after that. Only a little, but it was noticeable progress, and that was enough to calm her father and me down. Then, when she'd smacked her brother five-year-old Peter so hard he cried, she took a walk around the perimeter of the house without being asked. Within seconds, I was on her tail, red in the face, ready to lock her in her room for the next 15 years out of an irrational parental panic. She stopped when my shadow overtook hers, and I started talking. She wasn't listening to me, though. She'd noticed a bird's nest tucked near a vent, three peeping bodies waiting for their mother. I didn't figure out what they were until she'd popped one's head off between her little sausage fingers. I gave her a bath while her father made calls, trying to get an appointment with a child psychologist. I told her what she did was very, very bad, and she needed to be nicer to animals, especially itty-bitty ones. How would you like it if someone tried to hurt you, I said, a thin film of discipline over the well of disgust inside me. She shrugged. Mary enjoyed shrugging, staring right at you with big empty eyes. Those next months blurred into years, my husband Peter and I all struggling against the chaos that was Mary. Her new therapist explained violence was somewhat normal at this age, but her resistance towards healthy discipline wasn't. She was tested for all kinds of disorders, ranging from a DHD to PTSD to reactive attachment disorder, and while her results never came up looking like a normal child's, they were never conclusive as to what was going on in her mind. Soon the questions were pointed at my husband and I, then at Peter in case we were lying. We found a psychiatrist willing to prescribe psychiatric medication to a four-year-old. The only substance with any effect was Adderall, which made her ability to hunt for bird nests a little more efficient. We then found a less trustworthy psychiatrist willing to prescribe tranquilizers to a five-year-old. We hoped that if she could just calm down a little bit, we could get something through to her, or at least go a day without seeing blood on her face. My sister threatened to call CPS over that when she found out. We stopped. It's not as if the Tranks were helping we deluded ourselves into thinking they did when she seemed less inclined to violence, but now I attribute that more to the lack of stimulants in her system. Then, two days ago, she menaced Peter with a pair of scissors she'd stolen from her teacher's desk. The first graders weren't allowed to have normal scissors. She didn't draw blood, didn't even make contact with his skin, but it was too much. I asked her why she'd do that, and she shrugged, looking at me with her empty brown eyes. It was like she wasn't even human. I told her to go take a long, long walk. The officer ended his line of questioning after some amount of time I couldn't guess. My mind was spinning, exhausted and terrified yet secretly, quietly, relieved. We'll do everything we can, my am. Thank you, I mumbled, and left the station in a daze, barely managing to open the passenger side door and take a seat next to my husband. Do they need to talk to me? They have your number. He said they'll call if they need to. We drove home, silent. There was nothing else to say. It's possible that I didn't try hard enough as a mother, that I was neglectful, and had somehow allowed some more nefarious abuse to slip into her life. The mere fact that my father thought it was okay to spank her was good evidence. She may have been reacting to something happening I didn't know about. But if that were the case, it was something she refused to say even to her therapists, her brother, her aunts and uncles. There was no amount of questioning people felt was too much when dealing with her, and she answered every question, sometimes with lies, sometimes with uncomfortable honesty. Nothing to indicate trauma, aside from her behavior. And honestly, I loved Mary. I had gone through so much pain and suffering, but my husband and son through that same suffering all while clinging to the smallest hope that someday she could be healthy and happy and friendly. I would have let her kill the dog if it meant she'd learn what it meant to hurt someone. Peter, however, was on track to become a wonderful person in spite of his sister, and at that moment she seemed to choose him as a sacrifice. While she walked, I came up with a plan. I told my husband, and we cried in each other's arms, out of mourning and relief that what we'd never been able to admit to each other was finally in the open. Neither of us had the strength to hurt her directly. While she slept, we put her inside of a sleeping bag, drove to a secluded riverbank, and took deep shuddering breaths as we heaved it back and forth in our arms. It was the only way we could make sure Peter would be safe, 
Of course, this decision has its own drawbacks. I'll never be able to stop thinking about what I'd done wrong, how I could have stopped this, how I let myself consider hurting my own flesh and blood. Peter will grow up having to wonder if his own parents are capable of the most heinous act, and he might be subjected to a complete media circus if they find evidence against us. And now, as I type this at night, I'm coming to believe in vengeful spirits. I don't know how else to explain the sound of a little fist knocking on the door. Until next year when I visit young Clyde. Story 5. My son went missing on Christmas, and I just found something disturbing in his room. I believe it goes without saying that every parent's worst nightmare is losing their children. Three days ago, that nightmare became a reality for me as I took a single bite of Santa's cookie and went upstairs to wake my two boys up. My youngest, Clyde, had already been awake and sitting patiently on his bed, eagerly awaiting my signal to head downstairs and start opening gifts. This was not all too surprising, what 12 and 7-year-old boys sleep in on Christmas morning. What was surprising was that Jack's bed was empty. He was nowhere to be found, despite my tucking him in his bed and wishing him a good night around 9 p.m. the previous night. The detectives are supposedly still investigating, but I am fully aware of the horrifying statistic that after the first 48 hours of being missing, the chances of finding my son become very slim. I'm also quite sure that they still consider me a suspect, although their initial investigation failed to prove that. Earlier today, while helping Clyde with his math homework, I threw one of his little Nerf footballs across the room, and after a couple bounces, it became lodged between the wall and Jack's bed. I walked on over and pulled the bed away from the wall a bit to retrieve it, and that's when I noticed the loose floorboard. I don't understand how this was missed by both myself and the detectives that scoured his room, but it was quite obvious once I did notice it. I believe what I found in there may have something to do with Jack's disappearance. Being a single father of two and working a full-time job left me very little time, especially around the holidays, to carry on the many different Christmas traditions that I had as a child. So on the first day of December, when I first saw the little raggedy-looking elf on the shelf, I was very impressed that Jack had took it upon himself to start this tradition for his little brother. When I had first asked him about it, his demeanor changed drastically and he demanded that no one ever touch the elf. I left it at that. After all, the story says the elf will lose its magic if touched by a human. I didn't want to ruin it for Clyde, so I just played along. Each morning the little elf would show up in a new spot in our small home. I was so proud of my boy for being such a great big brother. The reason I bring the elf up is because what I found under the floorboard in his room was some kind of homemade children's book titled Elf on the Shelf. It was written crudely with different colored markers for each letter, although clearly written by someone with a very shaky hand. I handed the book over to the detectives, but not before writing down a copy for myself. I really don't know what to make of this, but I know it has something to do with whoever took my son. Elf on the shelf. Have you ever wondered how anyone could know? If you're naughty or nice each year as you grow. For hundreds of years, it's been a big secret. It now can be shared, if you promise to keep it. This year you were chosen, he sent me to you. I watch and report on all that you do. My job's an assignment from the big man himself. I am just his helper, a little scout elf. While I'm here visiting the place you call home, remain in your room, be sure not to roam. Once you are ready, the mission can start. Whose name will you scream as he rips out your heart? Will it be father or Clyde? He can't take you all, so you must decide. Each night while you're sleeping, to your room he will fly. No one can know, or else they will die. Of course, a little magic helps me be quick. I record your whole day and report with a click. I tell him if you have been good or been bad. The news of the day makes him happy or sad. One word about this, and I'll report to the boss, but keeping this secret will not be a loss in the car, at the park, or even at school. Word will get out if you break a rule. He will be gone before you awake. Speak a word to anyone and your brother he'll take. You'll jump out of bed and come running to see. Who'll be the first to beg and to plea? Maybe in the kitchen, the bathroom, or the den. 
is where you'll find dear Clyde met his end. I can hide on a plant, a shelf, or a frame. Where will I be? Let's make it a game. There's another important rule you must know. Choose to ignore it, and his rage will grow. Keep your window unlocked before you climb into bed. Think wonderful thoughts inside that little head. How else can he check how good you have been? He might start to think you forgot about him. The night before Christmas, my job's at an end. The rest of the year, in paradise we'll spend. So blow them a kiss and bid them farewell. We'll fly far away, but you can never tell. Of course they will miss you, but wait till next year. When the holidays come, I'll again reappear. I wish every girl and each boy a safe to place to hide. My little sister Ella died a year ago. She was only 12. The doctor said it was natural causes, but there was nothing natural about what happened to her. The truth is, our family killed her, slowly, over years of cruelty. It wasn't sudden, but a slow, deliberate breakdown of her spirit, of her soul. They broke her. Our father died when we were young, and my sister and I were taken in by his side of the family. It was supposed to be temporary, until our mother could get back on her feet. But it wasn't. Ella suffered the most. My father's family, my uncle, aunt, cousins hated us. They hated her. They were monsters, but they wore the faces of family. The worst part. I couldn't do anything to stop it. I tried to protect Ella, but I was just a kid too. She'd get locked in the basement for days, the door clicking shut behind her while my aunt turned the key with a smile. Sometimes, they'd forget to feed her. Other times, they'd do it on purpose. It wasn't just the physical abuse, it was the torment. The things they said to her. They loved to make her feel small, powerless. I remember seeing her eyes when they told her she wasn't worth anything, that no one would miss her if she disappeared. Her eyes went empty, dead. I didn't realize that, in a way. She'd already died long before her heart stopped. Ella's death was a relief to them, a way to erase their guilt, bury their sins. I think they believed deep down that once she was gone, all the things they had done would be buried with her. They never expected what would happen next. At the funeral, something strange happened. Our mother broken, hollow, not really there, stood apart from the rest of the family. She wasn't crying. She hadn't cried since the day Ella died. I watched her walk up to the casket, her hands trembling as she touched Ella's cold face. For a moment, it looked like she was about to break down, but she didn't. Instead, she leaned over Ella's still body and whispered something into her ear. I wasn't close enough to hear it, but I saw the look in her eyes. I'll never forget that look. It was unsettling, like she was speaking to someone she knew would hear her, someone who wasn't really gone. Later that night, I asked her what she whispered. At first, she didn't answer. She just stared at me, her expression unreadable. But then, in a voice that was barely a whisper, she told me, I told her to avenge me. I didn't understand what she meant at the time. I thought it was just her grief talking. After all, the family had taken everything from us. I thought she was just angry, broken. But now looking back, I realize it was something much darker. The first sign that something was wrong happened the night after the funeral. It started with the sounds. It was subtle at first, soft whispers that seemed to come from the walls, like distant voices carried on the wind. But the house was still. There was no wind. I remember standing in the hallway, holding my breath, listening. It wasn't random noise. It was too clear, too deliberate. You know what you did. At first, I thought it was my imagination. I told myself I was just hearing things, but the whispers grew louder each night. They weren't coming from outside. They were inside the house, crawling through the cracks in the walls, echoing in the corners. Sometimes I'd catch a word or two, but other times it was just the soft, almost pleading sound of a voice I couldn't place. But the others heard it too. My uncle, the cruelest of them all, was the first to crack. He began waking up in the middle of the night drenched in sweat, screaming about seeing something in his room. He swore that Ella was standing at the foot of his bed, watching him. She's not gone, he'd muttered to himself during the day, pacing back and forth. His eyes were wild, 
sunken like he hadn't slept in weeks. She's still here. No one believed him. They thought he was losing his mind, but I believed him because I saw her too. It started small, out of the corner of my eye. I'd catch glimpses of her just for a second standing in doorways or reflected in windows. She was never close, never fully there, but it was her. I know it was. Her face was pale, hollow, and her eyes, they weren't the same. They were dark, like empty pits, staring back at me. Her expression never changed. It was like she was waiting for something or someone. I tried to ignore it, tried to convince myself that it was just my mind playing tricks on me. But deep down, I knew Ella wasn't resting. She was waiting. Then the scratches started. It was late one night when I heard it a slow, deliberate scraping sound, like nails dragging across the walls. It came from inside the house, from the basement, where they used to lock her away. I wanted to believe it was a rat, or maybe just the house settling, but when I went downstairs to check, I found something much worse. The walls were covered in deep scratches, gouged into the plaster, as if something or someone had been clawing at it, trying to escape. But that wasn't the worst part. Above the scratches, carved in the same jagged lines, were words. Words I knew weren't there before. You will pay. My uncle was the first to die. They said he fell down the stairs in the middle of the night, that it was a tragic accident. But I know what really happened. I saw his face before they covered it up. His eyes were wide open, filled with terror, as if he had seen something. Something that shouldn't have been there. After he died, Things escalated. The whispers became louder, more insistent. The footsteps started slow, deliberate, like someone walking through the house in the dead of night. Every time they happened, I would freeze, listening, praying it would stop. But it never did. My aunt, who had locked Ella in the basement so many times, began hearing voices. At first, she thought it was just her imagination, but the whispers followed her everywhere. In the bathroom, in her bedroom, even in her car. Always the same voice. Always Ella. She begged for it to stop, but it didn't. She started sleeping with the lights on, but that didn't help either. One morning, I found her sitting on the floor of her room, her eyes wide and vacant, mumbling to herself. She wouldn't look at me, wouldn't respond. All she did was repeat the same phrase over and over. She's coming for me. She's coming for all of us. The rest of the family didn't fare much better. My cousins, once so full of life, started looking hollow and gaunt. They hardly spoke anymore, their eyes darting around the house as if they were waiting for something. I knew what they were waiting for. Ella. It was only a matter of time before she came for them too. And then there's me. I thought I'd be spared, that Ella wouldn't come for me because I had tried to protect her. I wasn't like the others. I loved her. But lately, I've been hearing something too. At first, it was just a whisper in the dark, something I could ignore. But now, it's louder, clearer. I hear it in my dreams, and sometimes I wake up in the middle of the night with the feeling that someone is standing over me, watching. Last night, I woke up to find a message scratched into the wall beside my bed. I'm coming, and I know she is.